Markets were green and then they were red. And just like that, the market panic sold on the back of some very, very volatile news, leaving bulls holding the short straw. But is it time to get defensive? Today, we answer that question and why the market did what it did. And is there more to come? We're also going to be talking about sentiment, volatility, and earnings. Q2 earnings season kicks off next week with financials, and it's something that we need to discuss. We also need to talk about negative gamma. For the first time since October, the market is in a negative gamma environment and things can get crazy. So sit back, relax, We've got a lot to talk about. Let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell and like this video guys. Also leave a comment for the algorithm. It really, really helps me out. Cheers. A very red day today led by the leaders. Look at semiconductors technology, the big names, Apple, Google, Microsoft, they were all very deep in the red, but very green at the start of the day. And we're going to talk about why we did see this section right here of industrials, aerospace and defensives. They were in the green energy put out a fairly flat day as well. And then we saw pretty green days here in packaged foods and certain sections in utilities. So a bit of a ro defensive rotation taking shape. That being said, today was definitely a liquidation. I mean, after some of the news we got, the market just headed for the exit signs as quickly as they could. Now, looking at every single sector as a whole, look at energy, regional banks, utilities. You know, they were pretty much flat, slightly down on the day. The worst performing sector, semiconductors, metals, healthcare technology, the very big cyclical sectors led the market lower, whereas like energy, utilities, healthcare, staples, these actually did lose as well. You know, down half a percentage point, that is a lot, but they did outperform for the most part as the S&P 500 was down 1.19%. And if you actually have a look at this right here, guys, from about 1.32 p.m., the market was actually positive. It was really after we got a couple of key points of news that the market really started to sell off. Algos came in and zero DTE sellers came in as well. And that led flows to the downside. We did see quite a bit of support here at 3.30 though. But why did the market do what it did? Well, it's very simple. At the start, of the day we had very soft jobless claims data and we had a number of the mag 7 stocks get upgraded by a couple of banks that really helped sentiment to the upside it was sort of around this 130 mark where we got like cash Kari said no cuts maybe hikes a couple of the other fed speakers agreed blinken said that ukraine is apparently going to join nato the market didn't like that oil moved significantly on the back of that and then iran was also supposedly going to make a move a big move and all of these things you know lead flows to the downside and you know how it goes the second the market gets bad news the algos hop on the train the zero dte traders hop on the train and then it's just downside flows panic ensues and that's exactly what we saw today quite a lot of panic because at one point the S&P 500 was nearly up one whole percentage point. So very interesting to see the market move the way it did. And we actually pretty much went from this greed section right here into neutral, which is really, really crazy. Our last close was 64. We were in greed. We were actually in greed intraday. So a very big move in the market, but let's actually hop on the charts and have a look at everything. Every single major index, the S&P 500, NDX, RSP, mid caps, small caps, I WM. They were all down more than 1% on the day, except for the SP600 small caps. We also saw the VIX shot up 14% on the day. Yields didn't actually do too much, as you can see right here. Same with bonds. So yeah, a lot of it had to just do with news flows. Didn't really affect yields in any major way, at least compared to what we saw in the last couple of days. But having a look at the weekly chart, you can actually see that we're approaching two week lows right here in the S&P 500. Now, I do know that the weekly is still not closed, but yeah, we're not approaching. We're approaching lows from two weeks ago. Still not quite at the lows, but yeah, you know, getting there. Very brutal day today. That's a very crazy red candle. But hopping on the daily chart and you can see that our line in the sand this week was 5200, which was that line right there. We've actually broken that. The reason we use that line is because that was where we formed into negative gamma. And you could see that's exactly what happened. Uh, the second we get into negative gamma right here, guys, we actually get quite a lot of volatility. Now I did tell you guys in yesterday's video that if we are to get below the negative gamma zone,
going. This is the next line we want to look at, the 5116 line. And that's probably the next line um, that we really want to hold. I think anything below here, and we're probably going to go straight for maybe like these levels right here at 5038, uh, maybe even as low as 5078. So, you know, in Friday's trade tomorrow, you want to keep an eye on. 51.16 and look at the overall candle structure and the location we closed at the lows of the day so very brutal there's no way to put this the bears simply won the day today and you look at that and uh, yeah it's it's pretty rough but zooming out on the daily chart you can see we haven't had a red day as brutal as that maybe apart from here you know late december when the market was literally just like taking profits heading into the new year but let's actually hop on the five minute chart really really quickly just to suss out the day's trade and you could see we had this massive gap up and then we had very very muted trade all the way at the top here the second we broke below the day's lows okay it was a waterfall all the way down we had a little bit of buying here at the bottom but pretty much finishing at the lows of the day every single sector was in the red and that's a brutal brutal daily candle we're still in the context of this massive uptrend and even on the weekly chart i have told you guys plenty of times that until we actually break below this 4800 level right here that is when i would get bearish on a weekly chart and look to probably starting to enter short slash hedge my portfolio but until that happens I remain constructively bullish despite the trade we had today. At the end of the day, volatility is the price we pay for investing in the market. So you know the levels to look at right now. Big one is this right here, 51.16. I think if we do close above that for the week, that's gonna be constructive. If we continue this downside action below this level and close below the 51.16 level, I think we're gonna see more downside flows next week. But that's next week's problem. That's a problem for the weekend video. Go ahead, subscribe so you don't miss everything. And, and you know, we've pretty much called this week as it is. We said we wanna be buying the 5200 level, but if we do get below, we could definitely see some downside action. That's exactly what we saw, especially hopping into negative gamma. And for those of you that are long, this is a pretty brutal candle. So do expect more volatility along the way in the next couple of days, maybe even Friday. A lot of people taking risk off into the weekend as we enter Q2 earnings. So we are seeing some volatility coming to this market and do expect more of it as long as we are in negative gamma. If we get into positive gamma, we can see the volatility compress, but as long as we're below the 5200 for this week, the 5225 level for this week, do expect continued volatility expansion, both to the upside and downside. Now with regards to today's market movements, we got quite a jump in volatility. The VIX closed above 16 for the first time in 100 days. And this is normally what we can expect in return. So six months later, 5.8% return, 12 months later, 10.4% return, positive 100% of the time, 78% of the time. However, we can expect some near term volatility one week later we actually see down 0.01% so we can actually see more downside here in the market also two weeks later even though we are positive the hit rate isn't that great and even one month later you know the hit rate is not that great but we normally are positive so what this pretty much tells us is that in the near term we can expect some volatility but in the long term it should be seen as pretty much a buy signal simply because normally when we have extended periods of compressed volatility that normally means we're in like a bull market right here right here like we are right now and even right here you know uh you know this is like a good number of months even years before we actually saw the top of the 2008 GFC and, and this was more like global economic fundamental issues more than it was an equity issue. That being said, these are the stats and for those, you know, longer term traders who are buying for three, four, five, six, seven, eight years down the track, you know, something like this, these volatile moments should be seen as dip buying opportunities. You should be adding to your portfolios in times like these. We got some data here. So this is gold after half of the trading days in the past month closed at the all time high. Now this is a very weird data set. There's not a lot of data points. So it's a very thin pool of data. Generally speaking, you want 30 data points for it to be statistically significant. We only have one, two, three, four, five, six here. That being said, we can still look at the data because this type of data tends to be very, very rare. And when it does trigger, we can actually see some pretty crazy results. Now having a look here, we could see that six months later, 12 months later, when we've had more than half of 
of the trading days in the past month close at an all-time high. The six-month, 12-month returns in gold is 12.9% mean, 38.8% 12 months later. Kind of crazy. And normally when we see half of the trading days close at an all-time high, it tends to be the midpoint of quite a violent rally right before we normally get long periods of consolidation. So if we do see gold start to quickly ramp up here in the next six to 12 months and then consolidate for a while, that would actually be quite normal for gold. We can see the same is true right here. Now, the hit rates on these are actually kind of crazy as well. Six months later, 100% positive. 12 months later, 83% positive. And only in 2008 will we negative here in gold 12 months later. Again, take this data with a grain of salt, but data nonetheless that you guys can use. Now, looking at sentiment, this is the double A, double I sentiment survey. How do members feel the stock market will perform in the next six months? And we haven't seen any major changes here in bearish sentiment, pretty much flat. What we did see was bullish sentiment move down the tape to neutral sentiment, but you do have to take into consideration that bullish sentiment is still at historical highs. Bearish sentiment is still well below the historical average and neutral sentiment is right in line. So what does this mean? It means market participants are still bulled up. And until we see a material change in this, as well as this, do expect the market to continue higher or at least maintain itself at the highs and do expect all pullbacks to be bought. And the reason why in investors are bulled up has to do with price action and the economy. You see price leads sentiment and according to Goldman Sachs, equity pricing of US economic growth, cyclicals versus defensive performance is consistent with a 3% real US GDP growth. You can see right here, cyclicals completely outperforming defensives. Normally this does lead to about a 3% a GDP growth. And we do know that the GDP now is currently pricing in 2.8% for Q1 GDP. So everything does look consistent in that front. Although so we are seeing a bit of a divergence here with the US current activity indicator. Although in my personal opinion, I've looked into this indicator, largely unreliable for the most part. Now let's actually talk about performance. So the last three months performance, 64% of funds have outperformed the Russell 1000 benchmark. Very, very interesting, particularly here in growth. 70% of fund managers have outperformed the Russell 1000. 55% have outperformed in the value sector and in the core or a mix of the two, 63% percent have outperformed for an aggregate of with 64 percent of the average fund return outperforming the Russell 1000 index. Now does this mean you need to go dump your money into an active fund? Not necessarily but it could be a reason to allocate part of your portfolio to active management simply because when valuations get extended we see the pairwise correlation move lower in other words more micro less macro in other words it becomes more of a stock pickers market and all of this has to do with valuation. We can see that the 10 largest stocks are now priced at a 26 forward PE multiple with the S&P 500 X, the top 10, so the 490 priced at 19 times earnings. And this is when it becomes a stock pickers market. When valuations get extended like this, it's best to find growth at a reasonable price by diving into individual names rather than just buying like an aggregate index that can be overvalued and that can provide sideways returns for the next 6, 12, 18 months. Now, part of the reason why valuations are getting to these points has to do with buybacks. Both for corporate buybacks as a percentage of S&P 500 market cap by week actually ticked up and is above the seasonal trend. This blue line right here is the seasonal trend. This right here is the weekly buybacks and corporates are buying back stocks at a record pace. And the reason why we've seen an uptick in the last month has to do with earnings blackout. The earnings blackout period starts next week as we enter Q1 earnings season next week and we kick off earnings season with financials. We have Delta Airlines here April the 10th. Then we have Black Rob, Citigroup, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, some of these big banks kicking off earnings season next week in Friday, all pre-market. And normally they set the tone for earnings last earnings season. Their earnings actually came in quite satisfactory, particularly JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. And you know, that led to what was a stunning earnings season here in the S&P 500. Now let's talk about the real economy. US rail traffic, something we keep track of at least once or twice a month. Total intermodal units, 9.3% versus 2000. 23 and on a year-to-date basis up 9.1 percent at the same time we're seeing an increase of 2.5 percent on a year-to-date basis for total traffic and 3.2 percent versus the same week in 2023 so guys u.s rail traffic is one of the best economic indicators especially a leading indicator to look at how the economy is faring normally produce
producers buy products two to three months in advance. That's when they get orders. And this is pretty much telling us that rail traffic is strong, the consumer is strong, and the economy is likely to be strong into the second quarter here of 2024. Now, keeping up with the real economy, we're going to look at housing. So BOFA expect home prices will appreciate by 4.3%. 3.2% here in 2025 and a Q1, Q2 2024 increase of 6.9%, 5.6%. Both are expect at the end of the year, the average mortgage rate to be 6.6%, 30 year fixed and 6.3% in 2025. And despite commercial real estate being in a dump, residential real estate continues to thrive ahead. And this mostly has to do with the supply demand dynamic. You can see here that housing starts are fairly low compared to the amount of people coming into to America, illegal or illegal, I'm not going to get into the politics. Housing starts are very, very low compared to the amount of people that need housing, and that's supporting the prices of residential real estate. And I really hope uh, you know this problem does get fixed for the average American because I've seen some charts, and housing affordability is at all time lows. And I think some of the worst housing affordability we've ever had, and I think that is actually set to continue into 2024, 2025. Now let's talk gamma. Now rounding everything out, this is the consumer finance dashboard and it's just key metrics for employment income spending and lending and well they are generally mixed what this data does tell us is that the consumer is in a fairly healthy robust place as you can see they have jobs jobs are plentiful earnings are increasing as inflation is decelerating we're seeing real spending here in retail consumer confidence is fairly high and quite a lot higher from a year ago the big problem is rates. Rates remains the big issue and it's part of the reason why housing is so unaffordable right now. But other than that, you know, employment, income, spending, for the most part, it is quite resilient. There are a couple of issues you can see right here, new bankruptcy cases that can be a bit of a situation. However, do have to take into consideration that these are still at historically high levels compared to history. All in all, the consumer does remain pretty robust. Now guys, some big changes here in the gamma tape. So first, look at the amount of negative gamma that's forming especially this 5000 strike that's to put support the call gamma resistance is still at 5300 and we have a couple of other big strikes building here 5100 or 53 5400 as well and we have seen the gamma flip is now at 525 so above this line you want to buy dips sell rips below this you just really want to sit on your hands and wait out the volatility i wouldn't really take any shorts i'd probably only look to shorts if we get below this 5000 level and then we really start to see this gamma support move down as well as the core resistance move down the tape that's when i would start looking at taking shorts up until then wait through the volatility and if we do get into positive gamma and stuff and you do find attractive names attractive stuff so you're liking the S&P 500, you can then buy dip sell rips to the 5300 level. Now guys, we're gonna look at some BOFA charts. These are BOFA institutional charts that they send over to all their clients. 78% of fund managers have access to this BOFA research. So looking at these charts gives us an insight into what they're looking at. The S&P 500 weekly chart with moving averages, you can see we form this cup and handle right here. We've broken out above the 4819 range, made our way to the first target of 5200. And we can actually see the second target in the measured move takes us here to the 5600 range and then 6150 range. Now it's not to say we're gonna get there in the next week or month, but these are the upside targets we can look to in the long term. However, if we are to pull back, we can look to stuff like, you know, as far as the 4819 level right here. That being said, this chart looks bullish. It's in an uptrend and you wanna buy dips and sell rips looking to probably the 5600 and 6000 levels. Again, not in the next six months, but 12 months and beyond. Now, both have actually given us some individual names to look at. United Health Group, essentially, I'm not gonna read this all to you. What they say is United Health is at a very, very critical support zone here, 450 to 445, and it's a pretty much a must hold. And if they do break below, they're looking at a potential sell event that could go to 3550, 345. However, if you are a bull on United Health and there's no reason to not be a bull, this stock has done incredibly well since not even even before 2018, 2010, 11, 12. It's been a great stock, a great hold. If you are a bull, you could probably enter some longs here, have some very very conservative risk management stops and look to the top of this range. However, if you are a bear, you can look to 350, 345, and you could also
also see here that United Health against the S&P 500 continues to make lower lows while the stock hasn't made a lower low but it's at this very critical support that likely means the stock could go lower so just United Health group there for you guys now looking at Google Alphabet C this massive massive base forming uh, personally I think it's actually a cup and handle with this being the handle situation right there and a break above the 151 to 154 area could open up a measured move to 178 on the lower end 215 on the upper end there is key support zones right here at 125 130 146 however a break out to new all-time highs probably suggests we move higher into this 178 range and 215 range so data tomorrow is the big one the non-farms nfp as well as the unemployment data we are expecting 200k non-farms guys and an unemployment rate of 3.8 percent so those are the two major stats you want to look at you could probably look at the consensus of 216 but yeah you know 200 to 215 or 216 and then a 3.8 percent unemployment rate if we get those numbers in line i don't think much is going to happen uh, in the market but if it comes in really really hot i think we're going to see yields push higher and stock sell off as a result and a cool number wouldn't necessarily hurt but if you've made it up until here thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm cheers